For our presentation today, we would like to mobilize the process of wealth for as a way to present and explicate our ongoing research project and practice, ecological Gaia theory. Firstly, let us introduce our whale. Pequod is a mink whale, born in the North Atlantic approximately 40 years ago. Life in the ocean is rough, particularly before environmental and sustainability provisions and the regulating and legislating of whaling and fishing practices. Pequod has survived whaling, overfishing, recreational water sports, chemical spills, orcas trying to suffocate him, among other things. But like all things, Pequod ages. One day, diving beneath the surface, he finds he is unable to muster the strength required to resurface for breath. Weakening, Pequod suffocates and dies. Before his density will drag him to the depths, however, his body bloats with gases, keeping him afloat on the ocean's surface. Pequod here becomes a meal for sharks, birds and other fish who come to feast upon his body, cautiously, and then with growing fervour, as his carcass bobs and eddies amidst waste, gently pulled by the current towards a North Atlantic garbage patch. Much like his namesake, Pequod is a vessel, a vehicle. Through his descent and disintegration today, we will traverse and elucidate our research focus, ecological Gaia theory. EGT emerges in response to what next, where to, how, and why, following the ecological turn. Within academic discourse, this turn has acted as an impetus by which we've begun to reinterpret, reorient, and resituate ourselves with, within the world. Our Gaia maintains the oceanic sensibility we perceive in the turn, that which flows through and over fields, subsuming discourse, gathering histories, practices, and ideologies as it progresses. The ecological turn itself is foundational, a return and re-engagement of the academy to the original object of knowledge, the natural world, through interaction with which we initially figured out what we are, who we are, and what we are capable of. But this questioning led the human to become separated from this. We wandered willfully off the path and got lost. But our current context de demonstrates to us the inextricability of the human and the non-human, and the folly of ever straying. Before sinking beneath the surface with Pequod, let us rest for a moment, observe our context and that within which EGT arises. Our prolonged ecological crisis draws us nearer to a state of collapse. Multiplicities of presents and futures are rendered manifest through the wide-ranging consequences of this. With increasing regularity, real-life events demonstrate to us the entangled and enmeshed nature of things, particularly in regards to the growing visibility of non-linear causations and temporal distensions. These entanglements act to blur disciplinary boundaries and taxonomies. The porosity of being in and of the world becomes clear requiring interdisciplinary and creative approaches and methodologies, adaptabilities, and an embrace of alternate cosmologies to find a way forward. Though the future is obscured by the growing shadow of insecurity and uncertainty, there is hope in this return, as, in this return to the natural, as it provides an opportunity to revisit and recontextualize, reconfigure ourselves in recognition of the assemblages we find ourselves in, those which constitute the world as whole, beyond the self, inseparable from other organs, organism. These assemblages exist in endless multiplicity, the plurality of modalities hinted at by Manning and Mishumi. Acknowledging this, EGT seeks to expand the turn beyond the singular. We position it instead as an intertwined series of turns, a spiral. And this conflux gives rise to a Gaia, the whirlpool-like nature of which becomes an all-consuming, eternal recurring and returning, bringing all into its orbit. Think of Pequod's destination, the North Atlantic garbage patch, a constellation of Pequod, microplastics, petrochemicals, flotsam, jetsam, a site of union and shared matter and mattering. The exclusivity of spaces is broken down. Boundaries between human and non-human, organic and inorganic, blur and become muddy. Pequod, like all sea life, consumes microplastics. They bob around and within him, caught in the body and the current, in a strange symbiosis. Gyre is both verb and noun, a marriage of the site and the act. Our Gaia is methodology and ontology, couched within what is essentially a new materialist framework. It means a deepening our study of the world, in a watery equivocation with the deleuze guattarian rhizome, a non-linear and adaptive means through which, to re through which to orient ourselves in a world of constant change and flux, one grounded in an ecologic and accelerative and or distended materiality. The connected and vortexual currents feeding into our Gaia acknowledge this. The invisible pull and guiding forces of current read here as akin to the trajectories of Doreen Massey. Within the volumetric space of the Gaia, all things spin around a central, invisible axis, each rotation a different and distinct assemblage of object, subject, temporality and spatiality, 
waiting to be read and reinterpreted endlessly, either in isolation or together across time. Each cycle presents an opportunity to examine these subjects or objects in a slightly different light. Consider a couple of examples as we have explored in our research so far. The M87 image becomes not just a scientific discovery, a breakthrough, the image of a black hole. It is instead the dark half of the whole Earth image, the horror of deep cosmic time and an unavoidable future speaking to us in unison. It is the flooding of the town of Jindabyne, an oscillation of absenting and presentness actualized in registers of depth and water. The extrapolation of the Heraclidian River to the groundwater, the tsunami that devastated Fukushima, its nonverbal communication of stones, mountains and seismic activity. Our Gaia operates similarly to a trawling net, a shared space of the desired and undesirable, connected as, connected as much by the fibres that constitute the net as the holes which they create. And this is itself prescient as we consider a world increasingly defined by absence and lack. We read this diffractedly, embodied in the death of Pequod, and are reminded of Deleuze and Guattari as Pequod slips beneath the surface. He is forever decentered, defined by the states through which it passes. These states, or stages, of Pequod's descent, the pelagic zones, will inform our traversal of EGT. The first of these is the epipelagic, a space of movement powered by currents, invisible forces. For us, an act of revisiting that from which we emerged millennia ago, but we see this extending forwards in time also, to a future of rising seas as a force that will encroach, erode, invade, and eventually envelope the terrestrial. As we sink, we enter the mesopelagic zone, a twilight zone stretching from 200 metres to a kilometre below the surface. Some sunlight still penetrates this deep, reflecting off our Pequod's smooth skin as he drifts down. It is within the mesopelagic that we feel out the gyre as volumetric measure, as depth alongside and within eddies, currents, and flows. We position EGT as part of a broader shift within the humanities and contemporary theory, amidst increasing considerations of verticality, power, and geopolitics. Mirroring the atmospheric, the oceanic realm is politicized and militarized in a volumetric expansion of cartography and territoriality's flat discourse the horizontal terror of colonialism. They are aligned together, a continuity of sites of control, capital and warfare, whose volatility is complicated by pollution and the impacts of ever upticking levels of CO2. This extends into the earth, however, below the ocean's surface, territory, territory is increasingly marked out, mapped as sites for future resource expansion, an extension of mining's geologic wounding into the space often framed as aquanalius. Alongside this, we reflect on aquatic industry and its catastrophes towards recognition of oceanic space as comprised of life and depths beyond the human, in recognition of the presence, persistence, and fragility of the non-human. Our Gaia extends existing frameworks of wet ontologies presented by Peters and Steinberg as necessary in our world of flows, flux, connection, change, and uncertainty, a disruption of fixed and earthly ontologies through which, through thinking with the ocean. We acknowledge and embrace the interrelation of Laval's wet ontological perspective within EGT, in which flow is, on the one hand, a singular force, but on the other hand, comprised, composed of multiple chaotic processes in confluence. Kamal Braithwaite's decolonial and wet ontological counter to ossified and ossifying dialectics, tidalectics, is a way of countering terrestrial with tidal, a voyaging with and sinking into the flows to subvert fixity. As Braithwaite states, a being dedicated to water is a being in flux, an adaptability necessary in our fast-changing world. To be with the world, we must move with it, and the volumetric, wet, and tidal nature of the gyre enables us to do so, gathering and accumulating as we trawl. In acknowledging the beingness and adaptability of a tidalectic and wet ontological approach, we have applied EGT through engagements across text and place. This has seen us step into alignment with the rivers of Launceston and plan further engagements post-COVID-19 with flood preparedness. We engage pedagogic flows through our tidal workshop, which sought to mobilise the confluence between fluid and grounded, a slight specific manifestation of academic and artistic outcomes. Engaging tidal ethics and wet ontologies, we seek new ways to explore place and pedagogy, new ways of presenting work, including others, and engaging community-based projects, 
than invite people to reposition themselves in the currents and flows of the contemporary. In the current containment of COVID-19, this has taken the form of associative expanded newsletters and toward online modes of learning, which we will use to dive into abyss sites digitally. We recognize as central to EGT the merit of embodied participatory and physical research as demonstrated through interdisciplinary approaches, but also in recognition of cosmologies beyond those emerging from enlightenment thought in the Western philosophical tradition, those of the first peoples in Australia and elsewhere, the mystical and theological traditions. While we remain indebted to certain schools of thought, we turn to the work of scholars such as Deborah Bird Rose, Stephen Mewkey, Paul Carter, and Ross Gibson, those who engage with that discarded, disregarded, or denied for so long. That which demonstrates being in the world necessitates being with the world. But we must also be with Pequot as he continues his descent. Deeper still into the bathypelagic zone, here, between one and four kilometres deep, the ocean is almost entirely dark, save the odd bioluminescent organism. No plant life, and most animals survive only by consuming the snow of detritus falling from above or by preying on others. Our gyre is not just volumetric, but vortextual and dromological. As Pequot sinks and disintegrates, smaller pieces breaking away from his carcass also get caught in the current of the gyre. Due to their relative lightweight and density, they accelerate, endlessly orbiting what remains of Pequot. Speed, or as posited by Varelio, dromology, has come to define our error. We, th we see this in the shrinking of distance, both spatially and temporally. While this is occurring within our tightening guile, we see this manifest in the acceleration of natural cycles, the immediacy of feedback loops, endless flows of data, and we recognise this as enabled through the comprehensive technologization of the globe, which for Varelio signals integration and disintegration, control and accident, which we align with the movement of our guile mobilizing the gaps in our trawling neck, becoming attentive to velocity, and the sediment swept up into clear water. It's easy to grow unsettled in the darkness of these depths. These accelerations and distensions emerge through manipulation. The forces of capital exert a pressure capable of altering form and function, similar to the pressure found at these depths. Just as we have lost sight of the ocean floor in this dark, deep water, we begin to lose sight of the future. Things seem to be shrinking to a single point, in an ongoing and protracted process of world ending. We recognize our shared matter, sympathize with Heidegger's stone. The seemingly empty space we find ourselves in resonates with the world above the surface, one increasingly defined by absence and loss. The sixth great extinction, half a country burnt, melted glaciers. We learn to read around these absences, read the spaces left behind, grow attentive and attune ourselves to what might emerge and what might resonate within. We can embrace this absence and lack, mobilize it, make it productive, constructive, like ways, like Vey's decreation. We see this embrace of absence manifest within our methodology. The breaches and holes in our trawling net become portals, gateways through and between. And we trawl, dragging our nets and sifting through that which our research pulls to the surface. To trawl is an oceanic methodology, mimicking both the industrial act, which accelerates in the contemporary period, and the ways in which we wade through the endless flow of information in the digital age. We utilise the concept of trawling to gather up all in our wake as it circulates within the eddies of the gyre. Now trawling is one in which subject and object are tied through the spaces that they share, volumetrically, with the gyre recontextualising, repositioning and disorienting manner in order for us to continually engage with it in new configurations and assemblages. But all is not without hope, and there is still life at these depths some of which, the varying anglerfish, ostracods, viperfish and lanternfish, whose bioluminescence lights up the darkness around them, offer a beacon of hope. A whale continues to fall. Here, Pequot enters the abyssopelagic zone, stretching from 4,000 metres deep to the ocean floor. No light penetrates to illuminate the zone's blind and colourless residents. This is the abyss, a holdover from times when the deep ocean was believed to be bottomless. Our cycles shrink further as we approach the inverse apex of the Gaia. By this point, poor Pequod is rapidly coming apart, fed upon, stripped down, disintegrating, parts of his skeleton beginning to be exposed. Counter to early understandings, we now know the ocean is not bottomless nor an infinite resource. 
Looking to the collapse of fishing industries globally, overwhelming spills of oil into the seas, or the very trash dive from where our story began, human activity illuminates the limits of the ocean. Extractive industries drill into the ocean for oil. Fossil fuels perform a resurrection of carbon, becoming what Catherine Yusoff terms zombie carbon, a reanimation of non-human matter toward energy. As the consequences of these extractive activities lead to mass extinction of oceanic populations, the futures of our oceans look empty, save the detritus of humanity. It is an act of uncanny replacement. How, then, do we live with this visible future, the bottom of the Gaia drawing near? Accompanying climate collapse is a forced consideration of the world without human. Climate change presents a future where humanity is dethroned by climatic events, no longer the Earth's primary agent, the architects of our own destruction. How, then, do we reconcile ourselves with this wound? And what is the Gaia we are caught in but our future ghosts intermingling with a zombified non-human, haunting us, indistinguish indistinguishable from the Lovecraftian horror of the transparent and eyeless creatures that subsist at these depths? These creatures, such as the deep sea squid and sea spiders, have learned to live without light and warmth, adapting to the darkness of their depths in the absence of oxygen. What then can we learn from these animals in adapting to the increasing uninhabit uninhabitability of our own ecological zones? Further, how do we reconcile through frames of EGT with the temporal disruption caused by our cycles of acceleration and tightening, given the intermingling of the past through the reanimation of the non-human and the spectre of our haunted future? In the abyssal state, we are positioned in relation to an end, an entry and enclosure within the wounds we have created. We begin to understand this as, a, as being a more than physical wound, a spiritual wounding, the psychic ills of living through collapse. Manifest in solastalgia, petromelancholia, the world nesting inside of us and growing sharp. In light of the pressing urgency of this state, we look to the cycles of our Gaia, which grow tighter still, both pressing and disorienting. Entering into the abyss opens us up within EGT toward a relation between ground, death, depth, and the abyss, concept employed by mystics within a theological framework, Eckhart, Soli, Merton, framed by Charlotte Radler as a mystic relation in mystic topography. It is within these interrelations that death appears a synonym for abyss and ground toward a state of almost nothingness, redrawing space and time toward a union with God, or perhaps a union with Gaia. We can return this interiority, an opportunity not so much to nest inside the world, but amidst the world. The state we thought to be the end, the bottomless ocean, the abyssopelagic, is not where these layers halt. It is, however, where Pequot halts. The remnants of his body come to rest on the sea floor. As other creatures register his arrival, they flock to his carcass, slowly beginning to strip his bones of what little flesh remains. This process, known as whale fall, leads to the construction of complex localized ecosystems capable of sustaining deep sea life. There are a number of reasons why we utilize Pequot here to talk you through EGT. The process of whale fall acts as a form of what Simone Weil called decreation, the making of the world through the unmaking of the self. While Simone was not deploying this within an ecological framework, there is merit in recontextualizing it in this manner. Pequod rests upon the sea floor, creating a new world as he decomposes, disintegrates and decreates. In doing so, he is becoming with time the world before whales, before humans, before organisms grew up and out of the ocean and made their way onto lands in the earliest days of life on Earth. What might it look if we were to undergo the same process? Not the death, decomposition and disintegration of our corporeal bodies, but of what used to be called human, what used to exist as separate from the world at large. We take phenomenological cues from post-fall Pequot as well. The manner in which whales sense their surroundings, the water a connective tissue linking all that is within. Vibrations pass through this medium, register as presence and awareness. Following Jen McQueenie, we ask if we could take this to the surface. It fits alongside Bennett's notions of vibrant matter, Simone's attention, attunement. Even Lovelock and Latour's Gaia theory recognize this, in their nod towards a wholeness or completeness. The seafloor Pequod rests upon is a vast unknown world, comprised of valleys, fissures and trenches, and these true and deepest depths comprise the final pelagic stage. 
the Hadeopelagi. This largely unknown and sparsely inhabited stage takes its name from Hades, jointly the shadowy realm beneath the earth, which was considered the final destination of the souls of the dead, and its ruler. A realm invisible to the living, made solely for the dead. For the briefest of moments, let's put a pin in that. Pequot is going through a process of return. As he disintegrates, we think not in terms of years or decades, but centuries. His bones slowly become sediment, mixing with that of the seafloor, sinking back into the earth. In this, Pequod becomes once again the simple carbon from which his form was made manifest. Now Gaia operates similarly within a new materialist framework as a means of sinking back into, into deep time, the ecological, the stages between the carcasses of the new world and a becoming with the old. The Gaia has moved, has moved us into this hadopelagic state, a dark and unfamiliar realm. And these depths of the ocean represent to us the dual unknowability of the future, alongside millennia of permanence, that time before. How can we embrace this and learn from it? And to what end can we look to Pequod and feel becalmed by what he endures? Just as the ocean floor is not the end for Pequod, we imagine possible human futures in spite of our ever-increasing and wild accelerations, the trawling, the environmental degradation, the incomprehensible scales and abject horror of capital and technology growing ever out of our control. In this stage, we begin to imagine a reworlding, a future thinking, a world beyond the humour but marked by persistent anthropocentric traces. Pequod's return to the Hadopelagic, this aquatic Hades, the realm invisible to the living, can symbolise for us an attentiveness and becoming to the non-human, to that realm which was invisible to us for so long and which is increasingly demanding our attention towards reconciliation. And here we present EGT as a way of thinking through, understanding this interconnectedness and embracing entanglements of staying with the trouble, engaging in volumetric thought, submerging ourselves in tidal ethics, but more than anything, utilising this Gaia as a vessel for traversal between disciplines and between worlds in order to navigate the whirling, interconnected, intermeshed debris brought up and together by our trawling and by our being in the world. And may we emerge anew on the seabed in a strange and unfamiliar world but one in which we have communed, reintegrated and resolved ourselves with that which surrounds and surrounded us.